All right. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening to everyone. And thanks for joining us from around the globe. My name is Tanmay and I'm part of the Basecamp developer community team. I welcome you all to the webinar. Uh, and today we have uh, Alvin Subin, product developer at Temenos, and he's going to be covering multiple topics, which is Atlas architecture, data representation and relationship, data lineage and example of a data collection pipeline in Atlas. He's gonna be starting in, in a bit. Uh, before uh, the session, uh, there are a few things that I wanna tell you that uh, there is a Q&A panel which is active. So you can use Q&A panel to post all your questions that you have during the session. And uh, we're going to answer it as when possible. Uh, do not use the chat window, only post your questions in the Q&A panel so that we can monitor it uh, in one place. Um, also, we are recording this webinar, so it will be available on Basecamp as a resource later. So uh, you can consume it later or share it with your friends or colleagues um, in case they have not joined today. So let me invite Alvin and uh, he's going to take it up uh, st and start the session. Over to you, Alvin. Thank you. Hi, I'm Alvin from the Innovation Hub team. The agenda for today is as follows. First, we'll do an overview of Atlas, followed by the architecture. And then I'll discuss uh, the data representation, relationship, and lineage in Atlas. And I'll also do a quick demo about type and entity creation and show a very simple data lineage. And I'll conclude by showing an example of a data collections pipeline in Atlas. And then we'll do some Q and A's. First, an overview of Atlas. It provides metadata management and governance capabilities for organizations to build, classify, and govern their data assets. Uh, Atlas represents metadata as types and entities. For those familiar with object orientation, types are classes, entities are objects, for example, uh, instances or types. Atlas captures data lineage across components. That is, we can see the flow of data as it's transformed across different components. Classification of data is supported through tags. For example, you could tag data as PII and use Ranger to create security policies based on the tag. That is, only a certain group of users will be able to view this data. Atlas also supports searches of types and entities by names, attributes, and so on. Notifications are available and published onto a Kafka topic whenever metadata changes occurs in Atlas. And uh, lastly, we have hooks uh, to easily have processes like HBase, Hive, Kafka, and so on, send events to Atlas over a Kafka topic. For this tech talk, we'll uh, focus on data representation, so types and entities, and lineage. Now let's have a look at the architecture. So integration with Atlas is done via a Kafka topic or a REST API. The REST API is mostly used by the admin UI uh, over data sources like HBase, uh, Kafka would send metadata events over a Kafka topic. The core of Atlas is made up of a graph database. So because of the relationship between the different entities, the complex relationships, HBase is used as the storage mechanism and solo for searches. Ranger, as mentioned before, is used for data security. Next, let's look at the data representation and relationship. So in Atlas, metadata is modeled as types and entities. Types are your blueprint for your metadata. For example, a Kafka topic with attributes like uh, number of partitions, replications, and so on. Entities are instances of types. So, for example, an invoice topic. So, a topic through which invoices would be sent with a specific number of partitions and replications. Atlas comes built in, comes uh, with built in types. The two main ones are data set, which represents any data, for example, any variety table, and the other process, which represents any component that transforms data. Relationships between types 
uh, can also be defined. For example, a database is made up of one or more tables and each table has one or more columns. So this is an example of a composition relationship. Uh, we can also have association relationships as well. This slide describes data lineage. It's a visual representation of data flow across all components involved in data processing. Lineage is used to determine how data is transformed. It also shows the impact to the flow uh, of making any change to the data. Loss it can be used to find the root cause of any missing or incorrect data. Now I'll do a short demo to show type and entity creation along with a simple uh, data lineage. In the demo, I'll create what you see on the screen. So that is an event in entity having one or more fields being consumed by an event processor and transformed by uh, the same event processor to an event out entity with its own set of fields. So on screen, you can see the admin UI of Atlas. The main purpose of this UI is to search for entities, as, as you can see from the landing page. Uh, we can also create entities in the UI, even though we'd probably use the Kafka topic to do that. Uh, for example, you can actually select a type, any type, and fill in the mandatory attributes and relationship, if it has any, and just create an entity. Uh, on the UI, you can also define new classifications. So we have, or we already have some classifications available, PII, um, metric, JDBC access, but we could create new classifications. I'm not going to create any because I'm not using any for this demo. And uh, we also have glossary where we can uh, describe the terms that we use in our, for our types and entities. All right, so now let's have a look at uh, the type hierarchy before we start creating types and entities. So I'm just gonna show the built-in types in Atlas. So we have uh, several built-in types and uh, the two main ones are data set and processors. Data set is the parent of all uh, data. So for example, events or uh, tables. And then you have uh, processors. That is the parent of all components that consume, transform and produces data. And uh, the top level parent of everything is referenceable. And what it means is that every single uh, type is indexable and searchable in Atlas UI or using the REST API. All right, so now let's just create some types. So uh, for, you know, in order to be able to see them uh, quickly, I've prefix all the new types with uh, Basecamp. As you can see, there's no new type with prefix Basecamp. So I'm going to create some new ones now. Uh, this is the endpoint to create new types to post requests. And this is the uh, payload. So if I go over some of the fields, so each, so for example, this is a new type with name event in and the parent is a data set. Like I said, you have two main uh, types, the data set which represents data and the processors which represents the components that processes these, uh, these data sets. So I have an event in data set, an event out data set, an event in field, which represents a field in the event in entities or types. Again, that's the, that has data set as parent. Same thing for event out. And loss, I have a type process, which consumes event in and produces event out. 
Uh, we can also define uh, custom attributes, for example, for process of defined an attribute called additional info, which is a mandatory attribute and it's of type string. You could have type numeric as well. Cardinality is single, which means we have only one of these. Or otherwise, it could be a set. Uh, we can also have relationships. So this is an example of a composition relationship where an event in type has one or more event in fields. So we have the forward relationship and the backward one. So for the forward, so what this is saying is that an event in type entity rather has uh, one or more fields denoted by the name fields. So that's an attribute name of a relationship. And the cardinality is set, which means it can have multiple of these. Likewise, in the reverse relationship, a field is contained within an event and the cardinality is single, which means it can have only a single parent, which is uh, one event in entity. The same composition relationship is created for the event out uh, types. Okay, so that's the payload uh, to actually create all the types that we'll need for this uh, demo and the relationships as well. So let me send that. That's done. So if I go into Atlas now, and refresh the page. We should see the new types created. So event in, event in fill, event out, event out, fill, any process. Now we don't have any entities for this. Whenever there's an entity created for a type, you have a numeric value shown in brackets next to it, which denotes the number of entities of that particular type. For example, here we have 29 entities of type column. So if I search on these, it will return nothing. Now let's just start to create entities for these types. Again, I'm using the uh, entity endpoint from the REST at last REST API. It's a post request. And this is the payload to create a new entity of type event in. So you provide the type name and you provide some of the mandatory attributes. I think the only name and qualified name are mandatory, but uh, the others are good to have as well. By setting grid to the unique identifier to minus one, it's saying it's asking Atlas to create a new UID as this is a new element, minus one makes sense. So when this is created, a new UID will be created for this entity. So I created, so that's 200, okay. That entity was created and this is the UID for it. I'll copy this UID because I'll need it to define the relationships in a bit. So let me just paste that. Okay, now I'm gonna do the same for the event out entity. So similar information. Again, that was successful. So I'm just gonna grab the UID. Yeah. And if I go into Atlas, I should now see a couple of entities created one for event in and one for event out, as you can see on screen. Now, event in only has the properties. There's no relationship yet because I've not defined any relationship. So it has no field. It only has attributes. The same for event out. Okay. So now I'm gonna create the fields using the same endpoint. So I'm going to create one field for entity one, entity in, and one for entity out. So the field for entity, yeah, sorry, for event in is called uh, field one. 
So the similar attribute as the other, as the previous uh, request, uh, with exception of a type name being different. And we also have a relationship attribute now. So what this is saying is that the parent of this entity is actually of type event in. It's an event of type event in provided by this uh, grid. So identified by this grid rep. So I'm going to create again the grid of the entity itself is minus one, so that's at last created. So let's do this. Okay, that's done. I'm going to do the same for event out. So I'm going to create an, a field for event out. And now if I go into at last, I should see a field for uh, the event out, so field one of uh, uh, which, uh, which has parent event out. And if I go to the event in entity, I should see the one field for it as well. And if you click on there, you'll see the properties of the, that field, including its parents. But no lineage yet, because we've not defined any process yet to consume event in and produce event out. So let's do this now, again, using the same endpoint. Again, same information as before, except uh, pr the type name. Uh, but now the relationships, for the relationship, you need to provide an input and an output. So the input to the process is an event in, identified by this grid, and the event uh, and the output is an event out, identified by this uh, UID. So I'm gonna create uh, this process. As you can see, I'm providing additional info, which was the additional uh, attribute that I created for this type, this kind of process. As it's a mandatory, I have, to, uh, I have to mention it when creating the entity for this kind of process. So that was successful. So if I refresh this page, I should now see this kind of process. Yeah. So it's an entity of type process. So you can see the logo is a bit different. It has the input event in, the output event out, including the additional attributes and the additional uh, info attribute that I created. And if we click on lineage now, we can see uh, the flow of data. So event in is consumed and uh, by event processor that processes it, potentially transforms it, not in this example, but it could, and then outputs event out. So you can see the flow of data. The circle component is the current entity selected. So if I click on it, I can see details. So you can see the type name, the qualified name, whether it's active or not. So if you delete it, it's no longer active, but it's still in the system. So you'd have to purge it to remove it completely. And you have the grid, uh, the grid. You can select uh, other components as well. So you can select event in. If you click on the event ID, it will show you the flow from that component. As you can see, the impact, which is the red arrow, has changed. So what it means is if we make a change in event in, it's going to impact event processor and event out because event processor is consuming event in to produce event out. So we can see the impact of changes in any. Uh, part of a data flow. So for example, there's no impact if the a change is made to event out as long as nothing else is consuming it, obviously. So this is an example of type creation, entity creation and lineage. So a very simple, uh, a very simple flow of data. Next, we'll see uh, a data collection pipeline example in Atlas.
before I show the data collection pipeline, let me uh, show some of the types created for the DCP and their hierarchy. So on top we have a DCP type which is made up of one or more components, for example an adapter that performs syntactic transformation and a collection service that does semantic transformation. Each component performs one or more event transformation, for example a transformation of an invoice or a payment event. Each event transformation is made up of one or more field transformation. So how are each field map transformed from source to target entity? Now let's have a look at a DCP in Atlas. So as mentioned, we have a DCP project. So the top level, which is this. Uh, this DCP consumes a, an invoice event from Kodat. Uh, Kodat is a company that enables access to customer data from leading financial platforms, amongst many other things. So we are consuming an invoice from Kodat for this DCP. So the project itself contains two components, in an adapter and a data collection, a data collector. So the adapter is made up of one or more uh, event transformation. In this case, it's made up of an invoice transformation, but we could have a transformation for bill. So this shows an event transformation. If we click on the event transformation, we'll see that it's made up of multiple field level transformation. So for example, it's taking the status field from the source entity and con adding it to or converting it to a pillow.status field in the target entity. So that's a representation of a field level transformation. And we can click on the field transformation itself and see details of it. For example, the function applied here is get a setter. It could be a more complex function. It could be, it could have a template as well, which you could store in Atlas itself. And again, it has an input and output uh, entity. And the parent. So if we look at the lineage, we can see uh, this is an event level lineage. So we can see a source event from Kodat. So it's, that's a source invoice event from Kodat being consumed by an adapter, which is a process, transforms it into a Kodat invoice event. So this performs only syntactic transformation, for example, from uh, uh, XML to JSON or vice versa. Uh, so it only performs syntactic transformation. So we end up with a Kodat invoice that goes through a data collection service that performs a semantic transformation into a common invoice. So an invoice that be, can be consumed by any downstream systems of Temenos. So that would be Infinity, Transact, and so on. Uh, if I go on to, if I click on one of the events to see the details of uh, the entity, if I go on to the properties, so before I've mentioned that we can have composition relationships, which you can see. So the event is composed of many fields, but we can also have association relationships. So this event is associated with a schema. So it has a schema. So we can go and have a look at the schema itself in Atlas. So this is the Avro schema for the event. This is how the event is serialized and deserialized. The event uh, also has is also associated with a transport entity, and we can see the details of a transport entity. It extends Kafka, which means you'd have attributes specific to Kafka, like a broker, like the number of events per day, number partition count, replication count, and so on. And obviously the topic name. So what this is showing is that this event 
is actually sent over a Kafka topic and serialized using this average schema. So here we can see examples of association and composition relationships. And if we go into individual fields, which are entities themselves, we can see the lineage of a field itself, right? So this event ID was created from the ID of a source, uh, Kodat, so from the actual source event from Kodat. It was transformed in the adapter. So the transformation perform was a getter setter, as mentioned before. And then uh, it went to the data collection service onto the common event. So this is a field level lineage. So before we saw an event level lineage, but we can also see a field level lineage. So for example, if this ID has the wrong data or is missing altogether, we could trace it back all the way to the source to see which component actually read it. So if you have a system with 10, 20 components, using the lineage, you can easily identify which, uh, which component consume uh, or process a particular field. So you can trace back uh, all the way back to the source. Uh, you can find root cause, why the ID is missing or why the ID is wrong and so on. Right. So that's all I had for a data collection service in Atlas. Oh, sorry, a data collection pipeline in Atlas. Lost some references about Atlas, so the Atlas web page and the GitHub repository. All right. Uh, thank you, Alvin. Thank you for taking this session. Uh, thank you for your time. Uh, it was indeed valuable and plus the demo that you've shown uh, was very useful. I want to thank the entire audience for attending the Tech Talk today. Um, as I said in the beginning, we have recorded the session and it will be available on Basecamp as a resource. So um, you can share it with your friends or colleagues. Um, we are still here for a few, few more minutes. Uh, I'm going to be putting myself on mute and the Q&A panel will stay active for some more time. So if you have questions, you can post it and uh, Alvin is going to answer those. Uh, uh, post uh, the session, we are going to post the recording as well as the uh, Q&A transcript on Basecamp. So you can refer, refer to that again as well. Uh, also feel free to post your questions on Basecamp in case if you have, uh, if you have them in future. Uh, you can go to Basecamp forum and post all your questions. We have experts across Temenos on Basecamp, so they can help you, um, you know, with your questions that you have. Uh, thanks uh, once again, everyone. Thanks for your time. Um, and we hope to see you all again in the next webinar. Um, let me just show you the slide. Um, yeah, this one, if you see my screen, uh, this is on August 17. We have the next session, which is improving user experience with animations, data visualizations, and micro interactions. This is the one um, that, is, that is going to be posted on Basecamp very soon, and then you can register from there. Um, and for future webinars, you can just visit this page, Basecamp com slash s slash events, uh, and keep a check of all the, the webinars that we uh, uh, that we post and then you can register for all the webinars from this page. Um, so I'm going to be putting myself on mute now. Uh, the Q&A panel is open. Uh, feel free to post your questions. Thank you. Thank you once again. Take care. Bye-bye.